Okay, wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining Corporate College's webinar series live with the experts. Uh, we really look forward to providing you truly relevant information and tools, topics, everything you need to support you and set you up for success. Adjusting to this new norm seems to be a daily occurrence now and shifting to a new reality of remote working, learning and living has uh, really presented some challenges. And Tri-C is committed to serving you in this time of rapid change by providing actionable resources that can help you and help your team not only succeed but thrive during this time, whether you're working remotely or if your team members are still on the job site. Our webinar series is one of Corporate College's newest resources to prepare the workforce to overcome challenges and achieve both personal as well as business goals. And our series is comprised of four different themes with today's session really focusing on virtual leadership. Uh, other sessions focus on how to work better remotely, navigating a transition, even personal health and well being. And as many of you know, Corporate College uh, truly has a very distinguished and talented team of facilitators and subject matter experts. Um, it's with my pleasure that we're able to introduce uh, Mike uh, Wankwa again to you, that uh, he has been so wonderful to provide a number of different presentations. So as many of you might know, um, Mike has firsthand knowledge and fantastic experiences to be able to relate to different leaders at different levels within an organization. And really, even if you don't have a title of leader, bring out that best in you. Uh, he has been trained and mentored by John Maxwell, and he is an executive director of the John Maxwell team. So he knows all the best practices, tools, and resources and experiences to really help you and your team improve your productivity, performance, and profitability. Mike has put that directly into his own practice working for Intel Corporation for over 25 years and there he served as a mentor and led various different teams sales marketing technical teams and taught at their Intel University since then Mike serves as a senior pastor and has launched his own leadership and personal development practice and we are so thrilled that he is also a part of our team here at corporate college uh, so with that, I'm very pleased to present to you again, Mike Wanqua. Hey, Mike, how are you doing this morning? Geraldine, I am doing fine. How are you today? Oh, fantastic. And I can't thank you again for being with us, even back to back this week uh, mm -hmm. uh, with your sessions. Yesterday, I know that you helped us to learn how to really cope with so many different types of stresses that we're facing now. And it sounds like that really provided a great foundation for what your session is about today, too. Yes, 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 absolutely. absolutely. You know, I, I like the analogy of the plane. You put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help others, right? Before you can put the mask on others. So we have to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. So absolutely. I, I absolutely agree with you. Well, welcome again and welcome everybody. Thank you, Mike. Yes. Well, let's get to it. Leading <laughs> in a crisis. So that's our topic today. Leading others through adversity, leading in a crisis. Pick your favorite topic. It means the same thing. What to do when the storms are raging and how many of you would agree that the storms are raging even now? So as we walk through this presentation, just like yesterday, and for those who were not here, I want to give you this acronym, ACT, A-C-T, A-C-T. So if you have pen and paper or notes, uh, even electronically, as you go through the presentation, and for everything that you hear, that you say, wow, that, that was good, I, I really need to adopt that, I need to apply it in my life, just put an A in your notes and go, I need to apply that. You hear some other things where you go, you know, I've been going left and I really need to be going right. I need to change what I've been doing. So so just, just put a C in your notes for change. And then the T, the T, teach. I, I need to teach what I'm learning so that I can reinforce it for myself and make sure my people understand it. So teach it. 
So as you go through the presentation, apply it, change it, or teach it, okay? Look, I am so excited to be with you today. This notion of leadership, hey, it, it, I was created for this. I, I love talking about leadership. So I, I just wanna open with a few thoughts. There are five levels of leadership, and this comes directly from John Maxwell. And too often when we talk about leadership, people think about the first rung on the ladder or the first level, and that is position leadership. Position leadership based on rights. People follow you because they must, right? You have the title, the authority to lead, but having the authority doesn't necessarily make you or me a good leader. It, it, it gives us the authority to lead. Well, let's take it higher, which is the permission-based leadership, which is based on relationships in, in that people follow you because they want to, because of the relationship with you. But there's another level called production, and this production level of leadership is, is based on the results because you've delivered, you, you, you brought in the goods, and people follow you because they know you are a producer. But the fourth level, people development and people follow you because of your reproduction capabilities in that uh, you bring out the best in others. You help groom people for higher levels of authority and position. You are a people developer. But the last one, the pinnacle, which all leaders, I believe, should aspire to reach that level. And at the pinnacle level, it's based on respect in that people follow you because of who you are and what you represent. It's like this. I'm a leader and I, and I say to uh, a few colleagues, hey, I'm start, starting a new organization. You want to come? And they answer yes. And then they ask, well, what are we going to do? Right. But because of the respect level, the answer is yes. And that's the level we want to get to. So those are the five levels. And unfortunately, a lot of us think about the positional leadership and the only thing positional leadership does really, it gives us the authority to lead, but it doesn't make us a great leader. We have to be very intentional about leadership. I wanna share a few thoughts now about crisis leadership with that backdrop of the five levels Listen to these quotes and, and let me know via chat which one resonates the most with you. Maxwell said lead, leaders distinguish themselves in tough times and, and then they stretch to the challenge. Now he's talking about good leaders because bad leaders, they don't stretch to the challenge. See, I believe that adversity, crisis, if you will, either builds or it reveals character. And leaders are either forged, the good leaders are forged, and the bad leaders are purged during a crisis. And John said, all of the great leaders have one characteristic in common. It was the willingness to confront unequivocally the major anxiety of their people in their time. They understood that the, the people had anxiety and they were able to get out front and lead the people through that anxious time. So again, in the chat, just let me know which one resonates with you the most. And by the way, if there is any quote here you disagree with, I would love to know that too. And maybe toward the end, we'll come back and, and really ask, uh, well, why do you disagree with that one? Could we change it a bit? But these are some fundamentals that I believe are happening during crisis time for leaders. All right, here's what I wanna to do today. I really wanna talk about what followers are asking leaders. And before I do that, look, here's a picture. And this picture was chosen intentionally. I wanna take the time, what type of images or emotions or thoughts are evoked when you look at the picture? Please answer in the chat, and then I'll go through those three questions. So, Mike, while, uh, while people are responding to that question, uh, resoundingly, uh, the quote here from um, John Galbraith really, uh, really resonated with people. Oh, good, good, yes. 
Yes, dealing with that anxiety of the people. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then some liked all three. <laughs> and uh, you have a few, a few also with uh, favorites with the John Maxwell quote as well. Okay, good, good. All right. As we're collecting the thoughts about what image, um, uh, what emotion or, or so, mental image this picture evokes. What, so I see, I see a couple of them popping up right now, Mike. Some of them saying, yeah, really expressing joy and security, uh, a couple more about joy, even um, uh, providing help to someone and caring, um, yes. making others happy. Uh, good, good, good. And what your followers are really asking you whether they voice it or not, they're asking, first of all, do you care about me? And, and, and notice what's in red, notice what's in red. Do you care about me, right? Yeah, the company may be going left or, or the organization may appear to be crumbling. And I know Mr. Leader or Miss Leader, you need to take care of that. But what I really wanna know is if I'm going to follow you, do you care about me? That's a compassion question. People wanna make sure that the ones they are following cares about them such as the previous quote about a leader stepping in during that time of anxiety and alleviating those concerns or at least addressing those concerns. So that's the first question they're asking, do you care about me? And then there's another question, can you help me? Do you have the competency to help me? If I'm going to follow you, I need to make sure you know what you're doing. Right, the, 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 the baby looking at the mother uh, uh, as she gets older will realize that the mother loves her. She may know that even at this age and the mother can help her. But lastly, the question they're asking is, can I trust you? You, you may be able to, to care about me, you may be able to help me, but can I trust you? That's a character question. And I'll tell you from personal experience, I was in an organization for quite a few years and I reported to a gentleman who I believe cared. We could debate whether he did or not, but I, I believe he cared and he had the competency. He knew what he was doing, but his character was in question. And because of that, the relationship became too tenuous. And, and finally, I had to leave the organization because I could not trust him. During times of crises, Followers need to know that their leaders care about them, that the leaders are able to help them, and that they can trust the leaders. So before, before we go any further, just want to hammer in that point. Compassion, competency, and character. Those three things. Now we can add others such as uh, consistency, uh, being able to communicate and connect, but these three are the baseline. And as we continue to walk through the presentation, you may want to add a few more in the chat wonder what else is missing from here? Compassion, competency, and character. And as I noted, consistency, connecting with others. Whatever you think, put in the chat. And if we have time, we'll review some of those. But here's what I want to get to now. And then I'll give you seven things that we need to do as leaders in a crisis what we need to do while the storms are raging, right? So look, look at this particular slide. You, you see the arrows coming in. Think about the wild, wild west and all of the arrows are coming in. There's, there's a battle taking place. And while this is going, you have folks scrambling, moving, running everywhere. And, and, and it's at this time, this crisis moment where you as the leader must be the best version of yourself. You must be able to keep your head when others are losing theirs. So it's at this time when we just, we, we cannot be managers only. We must lead, we manage resources. We try to manage this crisis, but we must lead the people. We must lead the people. So the question is, how do we lead the people? The storms are raging. What do we do? How can we make the greatest impact? Well, I'm glad you asked 
you ask that question. Because the storms are raging, and there are seven things that we need to do, at least seven things. And we're going to spend the remainder of our time together walking through these seven things. So the first thing we need to do in the storms are raging is to face reality. This crisis that we're dealing with, the pandemic, is real. A leader's first job, according to Max Dupree, is to define reality. And, and, and what that really means is don't, don't define uh, uh, how it used to be or define what, how you would like for it to be. We have to define the reality as it is before we can move forward. And we have to begin with us, begin within. Okay, there's a crisis going on. There's a pandemic out there. And it's affecting people in a lot of different ways. How is it affecting me? What do I need to do with me to get healthy so that I can be the best version of me to lead my organization, to lead my people through these trying times, these, these times of turbulence? And, and as we're dealing with reality, we're going to hear a lot of bad news from people within our organization, even people without our organization. And I just want to encourage you, don't shoot the messenger. As horrible as the news may be, we need to receive it so that we can define reality so that we know exactly what it is we need to work on. And understand this. You may understand the magnitude of the problem, but does everyone in the organization really understand it? Understand what's going on within the organization as what's going on outside of the organization is affecting the organization? Does everyone understand the magnitude of the situation? And if you don't already have it, it's so important to have a climate of openness, where people can share their concerns, they can share what's on their mind, that was what's in their heart, what they see actually happening. Because at your level, if you're at the highest level, level, you may not see what's going on at the ground level. But having a climate of openness allows everyone to be able to communicate so that you can have a holistic picture what's really taking place. A leader's first job is to define reality and acknowledge the need that we must change. We must change from the old normal to the new normal. We must change. We may not know exactly what it looks like yet, but we recognize the need to adapt. Face reality, the crisis is real. Let me pause to see if there are any thoughts about this or, or questions about this before we get to the second point. Geraldine, are you seeing any questions coming in or any comments on this particular slide? Yes, yes. Um, you know, uh, actually, there's a couple of folks who have responded that, you know, they're um, experiencing as a supervisor and one's a manager, just experiencing that difficulty, you know, trying to um, convey to people kind of the, the changes that are going on in their organization. Unfortunately, one person has to look at maybe downsizing their department and really how best to, you know, maintain that um, credibility as a leader and and still keep everyone else, you know, engaged. So these are some really tough situations they're in. Uh, yes, yes, yes. And someone asked a question about how do I change or is, is there even a need to change if, if I'm not impacted by the uh, pandemic? And I, I want to take that question a little bit later in the presentation. If I miss it, uh, please ask the question again. Um, let, let, let me give you a preview. I believe all of us will have to change somewhat, but I'll try to answer that question more specifically as we go along. Sure, and then uh, these two kind of almost go together, Mike. You know, um, we have um, uh, 
call a message coming in saying, you know, many of the staffers are just now realizing that this is real. I know you're you're talking about how this is real and, and it does. You had mentioned yesterday too in your session how the different levels of people's understanding, awareness, and acceptance of the current situation. And then we have another um uh, Danita who's talking about, you know, uh in her in her situation, a lot of people around her don't uh, haven't been impacted. So how do you change uh, if you're not directly being impacted by this? All right, good, good. Well, as I walk through the seven steps, I, I want to address uh, some of those throughout the presentation, but uh, uh, very good feedback, good questions. Uh, keep them coming. And again, when we get towards the end, if I have not addressed it directly, please ask it again. And you know, you talk about some of the people uh, just now realizing that the crisis is real. You know, we we, we see e even in the White House when uh, that even the White House is affected, meaning that nobody's immune from what's going on. But I do want to address that when I talk about some of the things we need to do um, uh, during this need for crisis leadership. All right. First thing I want to say this, though, the second thing is none of us, none is Atlas, none is Superman, none is Wonder Woman. We really need to enlist the help of others. Business is a team sport. We may be the lead person in the business, but we don't have to try to carry the world on our shoulders. We don't have to carry the pandemic alone. This burden needs to be shared with others. And as we're sharing with others, we need to make sure we're focused on solution, getting the right solution based on what the problem really is. As we define reality, now we can start working on solutions for that problem and not focus on egos or politics, right? In the time, in times of a crisis, all of that needs to be pushed aside so that we can work on real solution. And to get to the real solution as we're enlisting the help of others, we really need to insist, insist on diverse perspectives within our organizations. Look, if I'm in a meeting, and I have someone alongside me that always agree. He, he always agrees with whatever I say. One of us is not needed in that meeting. Right? I, I don't need a yes man or yes woman in times of a crisis, especially. I need someone who would challenge me. I need someone who would give a different perspective. I need even the naysayer because I need to look at this problem from all angles, from a 360 degree viewpoint. And even we need to strongly consider getting input from people outside of the organization. Someone who, who can see the forest because they're not in the middle of the trees. And, and get this, if, if you don't get anything else on this particular slide, under this notion of enlisting the help of others, understand that being vulnerable is not a sign of weakness. It's a strength when we ask for help. It's a strength. It, it says that I'm smart enough to know that I cannot figure this out on my own. I am smart enough to know that two minds are better than one. I am smart enough to know that if we have three people working on this, it's like having a fourth person coming in because the level of consciousness rises. Enlist the help of others. Diverse perspectives are so important. Because if I'm going to the same people all the time, getting their input, I may miss something. This is why it's so important during this particular time that we have various perspectives, perspectives coming in. Now, someone talked about, hey, uh, I may not be affected or my people may not be affected. Then the question is, are we asking the right people? Are we asking all of the people? Are we soliciting feedback from a lot of folks and different types of people. Enlist the help 
of others. It's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of brilliance. So we talked about defining reality, enlisting the help of others, and we also need to discover the root causes. On the surface, <laughs> this is why I like the iceberg, on the surface, it may appear that the root cause is the pandemic. But beneath that, we may find a host of other challenges that we haven't had to deal with because we haven't had to face a crisis of this magnitude. So I want to encourage us to take our time so we can move fast. Take your time to move fast. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is, well, let me give this example. When I was in the military back in the early 80s, uh, my job was to patrol the east-west German border, right? I was in a tank unit, armored division, the armored cavalry division. We uh, had transitioned from the M60 to the M1 Abrams tank. And we came up to the border, but we had to keep the tanks back because we did not want the East Germans uh, to think we were provoking a war. So the tanks had to be back from the border, but we, the people, went up to the border. And one night in, uh, on border patrol in the tower, there was a large explosion on the fence. There was a real wall there and there was an explosion. So of course we were uh, somewhat fearful and we're thinking they're coming at us. This was about two o'clock in the morning. And we could have reacted, we had our weapons, they had their weapons, and it seems as though they had caused an explosion, they were coming. But we had to settle down, we had to gather our wits about ourselves, and we had to take a look at what was really happening. And as we looked through the binoculars and looked across the border, we can see the these Germans in their tower doing the same thing we were doing. They were scrambling. And then they were picking up the doctors looking. And then we found out that they hadn't started anything. We didn't have to respond to anything. We believe it was an animal that hit one of the mines that was on the wall that exploded. But had we moved too fast, we could have assumed they had started a war. We respond, they respond, it keeps escalating. So the same thing, even in our companies, in our organizations, we may say, hey, it's the pandemic. We just need to clean everything. Once everything is clean, we're okay. Let's open, let's go, let's go. But that's the tip of the iceberg. We may find there's a lot of other things beneath that iceberg that we need to deal with. Or, or, or that's a, beneath the surface of the water, I should say, that we need to deal with. So having that diverse perspective, when we have our team, we start trusting our team members to bring in the input. We trust them, but we want to verify the data. We want to poll everyone throughout the organization. And it may not be us personally polling them, but we have a mechanism where we can gather feedback from everyone. We may find that something is broken, but we never really had to deal with it because we didn't have a crisis of this magnitude before. Good leaders take the time to ask a lot of questions. That's another class we teach. Good leaders ask great questions. We don't have to have all the answers, but we need to know the right questions to ask. That way we can ensure that once we discover the root causes, that everyone's working on the same problem. Let me pick on corporate college just for a moment. Corporate college always wanted to have a online training uh, available for its students. But heretofore, they didn't have it as a top priority. This crisis made it a top priority. So, so it looks like on the surface, what they need to do is just adopt the online platform. Hey, let's go get Zoom. Everybody's using it. There are some challenges from a security standpoint. Well, let's get WebEx. Well, WebEx meetings or WebEx training or a different version of WebEx. Well, let's just get a platform. Let's bring it in. We're ready now, right? Well, what about your instructors? Do they know, know how to use the tools? What about those two-day boot camp uh, courses that you had? How do we convert a two-day boot camp that's very interactive into a virtual format? 
So my point is, if they move too fast and get an online platform and then just tell everyone, hey, we have an online platform, let's roll. No, there's a lot of work that even corporate college is having to do to make sure they can bring the best training available to you. See, there are some instructors like me, I love to walk around, interact and engage, and, and I adjust on the fly according to the body language of the students I'm interacting with. So how do we as instructors convert to sitting in a chair and talking to a screen? So the point of it is, we have to take our time to understand all of the underlying issues. One thing we don't want to do is waste a crisis. What do I mean by that? We're in a crisis. We've had to shut down. We've had to pause. Many of us, not everyone, but many of us. So because we have to pause anyway, let's do a full assessment and discover everything that's broken. Everything that's broken. And once we discover the root causes, now we can start working on a solution. So before I move to the next point, let's pause to see if there are any questions at this particular juncture. Thank you, Mike. That's fun. Was asking about um, you know really how do you help mitigate that mindset right now? So um, you know and and changing somebody's mindset or you know mitigating those um, challenges can be you know very very difficult. And um, want to make sure I understand mitigate what mindset that there are no root causes or there is no problem or what mindset in particular is she asking? Well. Um, and she has shared a couple of other um, comments here that, you know, it's different. It's very difficult when the current culture is keeping us separated. The mindset of the populace has become around a lot of like survivalistic type of mindset. Ah, ah right, right. All right. Thank you for that. And, and I don't have it in this slide. And I want to encourage you to read the training from yesterday as we talk about be anxious for nothing reducing stress during turbulent times. And in there, I have a particular slide that I use that I got from Doctors Bridges and Doctors Husband and Wife Team. And they created this slide talking about uh, going through a transition. And then going through that transition, uh, we have folks on the uh, red side, which are, are saying, I got to change. I don't want to change. I'm, I'm fearful. I'm, I have anxiety. I'm rebellious, not rebellious, um, reluctant to make that change. And they're in the red. And then we have those that are in that neutral zone. They understand that, okay, I've accepted I've got to change, but I really don't want to change, but I know I must change. So I'm trying to hold on to what was while I'm trying to embrace what will become. And now I'm in this state of uh, tug of war, holding on to the old normal while being pulled to the new normal. And as a result, there's chaos, there's confusion going on. And then there are those that are in the green that have said, I understand there is a new normal. I'm going to embrace it and uh, renew myself, ad adapt, change, and, and go with the flow. And I bring that up because the people you lead, and even you, even I, may be in any one of those stages at any given time. During this pandemic with my company, most of my consulting work and teaching work were what was in, in well, all of it was in person. And now having to move and make it virtual in the beginning, uh, I know I needed to do that, this, but now I've got to do it. So I had to move from that red to that living in both worlds and I've embraced, hey, it's the new normal. So my point is, as a leader, we have to meet people where they are. And it's just so important to really learn and understand our followers because we have to have different strategies based on where people are in that transition phase. So hopefully uh, that helped. The, there's a lot more to that, but uh, in a short time span, just at least wanted to give you that. Right. No, that's very, very helpful, Mike. And, and one other quick comment kind of question from Elaine. You, you had talked about um, good leaders ask great questions and really getting to the root cause. You know, Elaine wrote that, you know, if your group is not affected at work, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that they're not, that they are unaffected personally through family and friends. 
Yeah. So you really have to dig deep to really understand and ask those good questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and thank you for that. That's a great point. Even if we're not affected at work, and I would argue that we are somewhat, but, but I understand even if we, we're not affected at work, we know people that are affected, our communities, our home, uh, et cetera, uh, can be and most likely is affected. So, so thank you for that. And it's that connecting with people and asking those deep penetrating questions where we can um, uh, get to that. So, so, so great comment. Thank you for that. Uh, let, let me go on because, look, any one of these slides I can spend a day on, right? So let, let me try to keep moving and talk about this notion of preparing for a new normal. Look, when I talk about those transition from the red uh, to that, that neutral zone to the green, understand that we need to prepare for the new normal. We, we can do like the matrix in the matrix and take the red pill and go back to life as we knew it. Uh, the old normal is not going to be here any longer, I believe. Or we can take the blue pill and, and deal with the new normal, right? So we have to be aware, beware of claiming victory prematurely. I've cleaned everything. I've sanitized everything. Everybody come back in. We're good to go. Let's roll. And we claim victory. But if we haven't done that work of discovering those issues that we may have, you know, beneath the surface of the water, that really huge iceberg, then we may claim victory too early and find out that things may get worse. Things can get worse and they may get worse. It's important for us to prepare for that, right? We, we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. And it's so important for us to sacrifice short-term solutions for long-term viability. Look, from a personal note, I have not put my arms around my grandkids in two months. And, and that hurts because they're in the same city. But because we want to protect them and make sure we're protected, we do a lot of FaceTime, we engage that way but we're sacrificing short-term solutions for long-term viability. So we look forward to being able to hug them and spend a lot of time with them in the house in the near future. And same thing in the business, we make sacrifices. We can't run our organizations the way Wall Street want us to run it in that we just, every quarter we have to deliver. We have to deliver because what happens off time is we sacrifice our long-term health for short-term gain. Now, as you work with your CFOs or uh, whomever to think about the financial impact, my question is, uh, not my question, but my suggestion is, make sure we're preparing for the long haul. In 1986, Intel, uh, as you heard in the introduction, I, I spent uh, almost three decades at Intel. In 1986, we were heavy in the memory business. The company was founded on memory chips. And in that, at that time, 1986, the Japanese uh, came in with a lot of memory chips and they flooded the market so much so that our market share went down from over 50% to less than 10%. And it was getting closer to 2% and it was going to zero pretty quickly. Where the CEO asked the founder of the company, if you were somebody new coming in, what would you do? And the founder said, I'll fire the leadership team and begin anew. He said, Good idea. Let's go out the room, come back in, fire ourselves and reinvent. And Intel did. They left the memory business and got into the microprocessor business. And the rest, as they say, is history. So Intel went from being a memory chip company. Now, there was a lot of turbulence in that decision, talking with the board, all of the people changing the factory. There's a lot that went into that, but they understood they had to reinvent themselves because they could not compete with the Japanese dumping the memory chips into the market. They couldn't compete on price. They couldn't compete on quality. It was just too cheap and too many, and they had to reinvent themselves. And what I'm suggesting is like Intel, who had to prepare for a new normal, many of us in our organization need to prepare for a new 
normal. And we want to use this new normal to become more competitive and to make a positive impact on society. I like what Frito Lay is doing. They're doing they're, they're sharing commercials about the millions of dollars they are giving and the impact that they are making. So when things are good again, I'm buying Frito Lay chips because of what they're doing for the people. Now, I know my time is getting short, but there's at least two more things I, I really want to talk about. And that is this notion of communication. And as we talk about communication, I'll stop here and pause for some questions. But look, John F. Kennedy uh, said this, and he was quoting um, uh, Phyllis Brooks. And he, and he said, I, I want to get the whole thing. Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your task. And what he was talking about is he understood the enormity of his task. Remember when JFK was in office, he had to deal with major events, major events like the Bay of Pigs invasion, the Cuban Missile Crises, the building of the Berlin Wall, the space race, the American Civil Rights Movement, the early events of the Vietnam War. He recognized the enormity of his task. And whenever you're leading in a crisis, whether it's this pandemic or some other crisis that may come, recognize the enormity of your task. And it's so important at this point that we communicate candidly and consistently. We have to make a connection with our followers. Maybe you've heard about communicating is 7% is what we say, 38% of how we say it, our tone, and 55% what our body is communicating. If I were to tell you, uh, I, 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 I love you, I, I like spending time with you, um, your attention, my paying attention to you is so important right now. Uh, many of you are looking that are looking at the screen will see I wasn't making eye contact. So you heard the words from my mouth. The tone may have been right, but my body language said that I don't really care that much about you. So when you're making a connection, you have to communicate with your entire being. This is what John F. Kennedy did. He communicated candidly and openly with his entire being, making a head and heart connection. Recall what others are asking, whether they're saying it aloud or not. Do you care for me? Can you help me? Can I trust you? And that has to be communicated to the people. Why? Because leaders can afford to be uncertain. It's okay as a leader to say, I don't know. But, but we can't be unclear. Why? Because people won't follow fuzzy leadership. It's okay to say, look, I don't know the answer to that, but we'll figure it out together. Why that gives them assurances that at least you're certain about your uncertainty in this particular um, uh, uh, condition, as opposed to, I don't know that I don't know. That's fuzzy leadership. People won't follow fuzzy leadership. And when we're communicating, of course, we have to communicate within our organization, but what about outside? That's one thing about uh, this governor, he's communicating inside and at two o'clock almost every day, he's communicating outside. But let me ask you a question. What do I mean by that head and heart connection as a leader? Someone please share with me, what does that mean to you? Being able to connect with the head and the heart. And Geraldine, let me know if input is coming in. We talk about that head and heart connection. Yep, it is, you know, uh, talking about intellect and emotions, um, you know, that you understand. Um, another one here, you know, be compassionate while leading. Yes. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you want to become a great leader, if someone just said it, you have to be empathetic while being logical as well. Absolutely. We lead people here in the head and in the heart. And if there's that not, if, if there isn't a head and heart connection, it makes it more difficult for them to follow you. Because if you don't connect with the heart, then maybe they don't believe you care for them. If you don't touch their head, maybe they don't believe that you can help them. 
And the trust part comes when you're consistent in what you're saying you actually are doing as well. Right? Again, I love the quote from Andy Stanley, leaders can afford to be uncertain, but not unclear. People will not follow fuzzy leadership. All right, I wanna make sure I leave time for questions. And that's six of the seven things that I want to share with you. This last one, I want one of my favorite leaders to share with you himself. His name is Colin Powell. I, I take that back. That was five. This is number six. And then I get to Colin Powell. Lou Gerstner, who says elephant can't dance, right? He learned the lessons from the mistakes of IBM and he transformed the company. And what I want to suggest to us as we're going through this crisis, don't, don't waste the crisis. So make sure we're learning what we need to learn and make all of the adjustment we need to need to make. Now's a very good time to reinforce the organization's value or at least reshape the org's value. At Intel, we had six values and I memorized the values because our measurement and our promotion, our annual review was based on how well we were living those values. Even our accomplishments had to be tied to one of the values. Why? Because the company really wanted to reinforce what it stood for. Here's a good time to rethink the industry strategy, your industry strategy. And look, if you have the opportunity, reshape the industry to your strength. You go, come on now, I'm not IBM. I can't reshape the industry. Well, let me just throw out a few names to you. Amazon took over retail without owning any store. They started off very small, remember? Uber took over the taxi industry without owning a single car. Apple and Spotify took over music with no stores or artists signed with them. Netflix took over movies and TV for the most part with ever, without ever showing a single movie in the theater. LinkedIn, from a job search standpoint, Expedia, right? Taking over the travel industry. What's my point? These companies didn't have a lot of the things that we have, but they reshaped the industry to play to their strength. I really like Netflix in another class that I teach about leadership. We talk about the difference between Netflix and Blockbuster. Do you know that Netflix went to Blockbuster and said, hey, the industry is changing. We are a mail order video rental company. Uh, let us partner with you. And as those folks are going to the stores, at some point they're go going to stop coming and, and we can be your mail order division. Blockbuster laughed at them and said, basically, go away, kid, you bother us. What you're doing is dumb. And they had the head, head in the sand. And then Blockbuster saw, wow, everyone's not coming in. We, we need to develop our own mail order type business. And by that time, Netflix and the rest of the market had moved to online delivery when the internet exploded. Where's Blockbuster now? I think there may be one store in Oregon still open, maybe one. So Netflix reshaped the industry to play to its strength. Make vital investment during crises. I can tell you from my years at Intel, whenever there's a downturn in the market, rather than uh, trying to save everything, we made the critical investment so that when we came out, we would be stronger. If you have the ability, make the right investment. Keep key people focused on winning, what the new normal is going to be like. Have them focus there and make sure your image is created to be the industry leader. It's a great time to reinvent yourself. And then make sure after you've done all of that, you have the right execution plan. You do all of the planning, but you need to be able to execute on that plan and be willing to be able to pivot on the fly, to adjust on the fly. Learn the lessons that we need to learn during, during this time and transform. All right, let me conclude with this. Out of everything that I said, number seven, remember that integrity is everything, character matters. Here's a two minute and 45 second video. I wanna play it for you and then I'll have some closing thoughts and turn it over to Geraldine and get input from you.
I'm sorry, Mike. I'm not sure that that volume's coming through. Okay, if the volume. Right. Not, okay, no problem. If if it's not for, uh, coming through, let me just summarize. And basically, what uh, Colin Power is talking about is character matters. It, uh, integrity is everything. They asked him a question about leadership, and he said the number one um, of value is trust. And he said, if the people don't trust you, they will not follow you. And he's used that throughout his career. He's remembered that, that the people have, uh, must trust him if he is going to be followed. So he made sure he maintained his integrity. Uh, he understood that character matters. He was very transparent with a lot of his leadership skills. He tried to stay very consistent. And he knew what his values were. As a leader, we're in a crisis. We're in a period of a lot of transformation, a lot of changes taking place. And I believe that we need to know what our values are. Because in this world of a lot of movement and changes and transition, we need some stability, some solid ground that we can stand on so that we have something that's unchanging that will help us deal with the changes taking place all around us. Like for me, my, my, my values is in the form of an acronym called LIFE. That's my acronym, LIFE. What are my changeless values, the principles I stand upon, where I make my decisions? LIFE, love is the L, love, integrity, faith, and in, in empowerment, love. And in that love, it's talking about my family, it's talking about others, the love, the integrity, making sure that I am not doing anything that would violate my character. And the, the faith and family is making sure I don't do anything that will compromise my faith. And then the encouragement or the empowerment, making sure I'm encouraging others, I'm empowering others, I am educating others because my life mission is to bring out the best in others. So those are the values that I stand upon so that when things are changing around me, I can hold on to my core values and then adjust as necessary with my head. So Colin Power says, if they can't trust you, they will not follow you. And I just wanna remind us that integrity is everything. Now, with that, my last thought, and then we'll take questions and I'll turn it over to Geraldine. The storms are raging, but you, leader, yes, you, you're the lighthouse. You're the ones they are looking to. You're the one that is in the spotlight. They are going to take their cue, their directions from you. So don't be encumbered by the past. Go out and do something wonderful and lead your people. Thank you for your time today, Geraldine. Oh, great. Fantastic again, Mike. Really, really, um, so many comments and questions coming in. Um, I think we have time for a few of them. One comment, though, and question is from Dwayne. He said, and this is going back to when you were talking about the cause and effect. And he asked, you know, would you agree that one can't address the fruit of what's going on without addressing the root cause and effect. I absolutely agree with that. Yes, yes, I, I absolutely agree. If we don't ask enough penetrating questions to to get down to what's really what the real cause is, then we end up treating the symptom, the symptom, but not the underlying cause. It's like when you go to a doctor, if I keep sneezing, they take a pill for dealing with the sneeze. But the real cause is I keep going out here into the flower bed and, it, and I have allergic reactions to it. I can take all the pills and medicine I want, but unless I deal with that particular root cause, I'm going to keep covering up the symptom. So uh, he, he is absolutely right. We have to ask the right questions and dig deeper so that we can make sure we're solving the right problem. Perfect. And uh, Deontay has a, a really interesting uh, question here. Um, he says, I really believe that life runs in cycles. And there are, uh, are there any examples that we can look back to as a reference and learn how to work through this particular situation? Yes, <laughs> there they are, they are plenty. 
Um, you know, when we think about the pandemic itself, uh, you know, th there's a saying that if, if you don't learn from history, you're bound to repeat it. And I really believe that we can go back to the Spanish flu, see what was done. Uh, we can go back to even 9-11 to see what we personally went through. Maybe we were not in a leadership position then, but we're in a leadership position now. Think about how we felt so that we can relate with how the people who are following us feel. Uh, we can go back to the SARS epidemic and see during then uh, we wore masks for a little while. I spent time living in China, uh, managing a team over there, and it was commonplace even during times of health where people still wore their mask. So there are different things uh, that we can look at in our lives. Look, someone said experience is the best teacher. I don't believe that. I don't. I believe evaluated experience is the best teacher. We have so many things that we can go back and evaluate, take the key lessons and apply them over here uh, to whatever we're going through today. So absolutely. And we don't even have to go read in a book. We can look at our own lives. If we take the time to evaluate all of our experiences or most of them, we'll find some key nuggets and may even find some common themes of things that we need to change or some things we need to keep doing. So yes to your question. Perfect, perfect. That's that, that is true. You know, and you have to pull out. I don't know that we've had anything personally that we've all experienced um, like this particular situation, but many of us, I'm sure, have, you know, had different types of uh, situations, personal or living through, you know, different types of weather catastrophes or other yeah. you know, other trying times. So. Um, yeah. Kim also has another question for you, Mike. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is a real delicate one, especially, you know, now that uh, we've, you know, most of us have transitioned into kind of this virtual type of working environment. She asks, how do you uh, navigate working with a leader who is rather, you know, maybe not as pleasant or as kind as they should be, doesn't always say please or thank you, sometimes very vague with directions. Um, how do you deal with that person now when it has become increasingly challenging to communicate in this virtual environment and not being able to be face to face? Wow. Wow. How can I answer that in two minutes? All right. Let me try to give you the Reader's <laughs> Digest version because that is a great question. And this really is about taking ownership of your own career. And we know we can't change another person. Uh, but we can change how we respond to that particular person. Uh, one of the things that I would recommend is that we write down exactly what we think it is we're supposed to be doing because there's some fuzzy leadership out there. I understand that you said as much that the directions are not always clear. And I would even write down, hey, here are the things you're asking me to do. Here are the top five things. Uh, I just want to get with you to prioritize. What do you, what are the priorities from your perspective, Mr. Leader or Ms. Leader? And, and that's the first thing we prioritize. Uh, and then the next thing is, hey, I'm sure I'm communicating with you uh, appropriately, uh, however, whatever term you want to use. And with some people in another class, I talk about, I think it's uh, tomorrow, I talk about the, the different communication styles, right? You got that driver. I don't want to embrace, I don't want to talk about the weather. I just need to get to the point. Some people are driven like that. You have the analytical style, which is show me the data, right? Give me the data, whatever you say, I got to have the proof behind it. And you have that amiable style that says, we got to talk about the weather and my grandkids before we can deal with any business. And then the expressive style where you got to stroke their ego, or at least give them a compliment or, or, or allow them to talk about their vision before you can get to the root. So here's the challenge we have. You have those four major styles and you as the individual has, has, must adjust your style somewhat to address their style. And that way you can have a worthwhile conversation realizing everyone's not like you, everyone's not like me. I wanna get to the point, but I realize sometimes I need to talk about the grandkids before I can get to the point. Like I said, that answer goes a lot more deeper, but that's the Reader's Digest version. 
No, that that was great. That was absolutely great, Mike. Um, and it is. Uh, you have to be very delicate with that. Um, and as we're run, uh, closing in on time here, I just wanted to uh, mention uh, Jan had a you know and a number of people just thanking you for today's presentation um, and even yesterday's. But if we could ch maybe change the slide, Mike, uh, she was hoping maybe we could just uh, go back to the one that had the JFK quote. Um, sure just wanted to take a quick look at that, um, sure. you know, just because of um, the impact in, and she wanted just to double check that. So okay. um, while, she's, while she's checking that, I give her the full quote again. And, and, and of course, she can go back and listen to the recording. But it says, do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men or women. Do not pray for task equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your task. He recognized the enormity of his task. Exactly. Thank you for repeating that, Mike. Um, and with that, on behalf of everyone here at Corporate College and, and everyone here on the webinar, Mike, thank you so much. Thank you for your service. Um, thank you for uh, your presentations this week has been, I know, um, a pretty jam-packed one for you. So thank you for being with us both yesterday morning and this morning. And I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. And uh, one of my big takeaways was, you know, remember to create and keep that climate of openness that you talked about, Mike. That was is so critical to really getting at all those thoughts, getting at the root cause. And I would just ask everybody, too, to please remember, you know, Corporate College is going to continue to be here for you with essential learning, such as Mike's session today, to really help you overcome the challenges you may be facing right now. Uh, we're going to offer our programs in a virtual classroom environment. We still have them offering in a self-paced online programs to make sure everybody can stay safe and healthy. And when you have fantastic subject matter experts like Mike, it really is a great combination to provide you that consultative services, training, even coaching we can provide. And we hope that you visit our Corporate College website to find out about these programs, um, everything from frontline leadership, Lean Six Sigma, continuous improvement, and even our patient access specialist program. Uh, so please feel free to rewatch this session and share it uh, with your friends and colleagues by visiting the Corporate College free webinar series page in the next few days. And uh, as always, please stay up to date with us by following us on social media. So thank you again, Mike. Thank you everyone for joining us and we hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you again, Mike. Goodbye, everyone.